revolution number three in North Africa, <laughs> and that's Libya. So I'm honored today first to speak in front of distinguished guests, and I'm honored another time to speak in a distinguished city where you feel history every corner. I'm distinguished for a third time, which I always like to remind myself of the, and the feeling that I am having now and every moment in my life that I am a free and a proud Libyan, enjoying my newly gained freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of demonstrations. For the first time, I stand in front of people, I speak, I don't worry if somebody is recording me or reporting me. Libya. Libya is a country that has not been known as a Gaddafi's land. Nobody knew Libya or the Libyan people. Everybody knew Gaddafi and his craziness. Uh, I come from Benghazi. Benghazi is the city of revolution. Benghazi has been a city that its fault is that it always stood for against Gaddafi. In 1974, four years, five years after him taking power, they revolted against him. The result in 1976, he hanged people in the streets. In 1980, there was another revolt in Benghazi where it failed, of course, and Benghazi paid the price again, and there were more hanging, uh, shocking, uh, assassinating uh, them outside in Rome, in England, in the US, and everywhere. He started punishing us more and more, and he went to his ugly atrocities, where he started punishing the people by taking their lands, opening sewage, and uh, taking their money, uh, living in a very closed and a black hole country. I left Libya when I was young. My dad took us out. I grew up in Morocco, I grew up in London, and in Switzerland as a final place where I prepared my PhD in international human rights law in Bern University, Switzerland. I wrote about freedom of religion. I criticized everybody. In the moment, I realized I never mentioned Libya. I never criticized Libya. I stood in front of myself and said, I have to go back. If I'm living in Switzerland, and I'm a Swiss national, I'm so scared, I'm full of fear, I can never be a human rights activist. I have to go back. So in 2008, I returned to Libya. And I started my journey to try to do small activism. It's very small. I didn't cross really red lines. But it was very tiring. It was very challenging. And it was very scary. I was blessed to be in Libya in the moment the revolution started. We were inspired by the Tunisian revolution and then the Egyptian revolution and tricked by them too. We thought that we couldn't do it as quickly as we did. The revolution again started in Benghazi. I kissed my kids when that was started and I told my sister, I have to be in it. That's what I was waiting for. But I knew it's 100% when I went out, I thought that there will not be another hour. It's a one-way ticket. None of us in Libya, none of us in the city of Benghazi who came out from the first days thought there would be a second or a third day. But we had enough. We had enough of fears. We had enough of being treated like rats, as he called us. We had enough not to have a dignity or a human worth. And that's what happened. And the more he killed, the more people came out the more he committed crimes against humanity, the more the people stood together. City after city, the Libyan came out. We had, it was a revolution, a peaceful demonstration that turned to an ugly war. Gaddafi is an ugly man. He has been an ugly man for 42 years. We fought him, I don't know even how. Every moment was a lifetime at that, in, in, in our, during the revolution. We were taking decisions while we are only normal civilians. We didn't know leaders. We are mothers and fathers. We are young, young, 17, 16 years old, old, rich, young. Everybody was in that revolution. It was a Libyan people revolution. It was not the elite. It was not a political party. We did succeed. It was this belief of those people who said, we don't care if we die, but we care if we lost the battle. And we repeated our hero, the only hero we had, Omar al-Mukhtar, that it's either we win the battle or we die. This fantasy, this illusions, whatever what we were doing, 
that carried us on in achieving and succeeding. We fought for an off-flight zone. We fought for an off-flight zone where people criticized us for that. But for us as Libyans, and I'm one of the fighters of the off-flight zone, not all of the Libyans were for it, but I was. I knew that if Gaddafi came back to Benghazi, he will commit a genocide in that city. He will kill and eradicate the 700,000 residents of that city. He will not think twice. We know his ugliness. We know that he doesn't even respect us or consider us as human. And he was clear in his speeches, which you all have heard. It was lucky. Lots of miracles happened in the Libyan revolution or war, which is more truthful about Libya. Things happen. Gaddafi worked for us. He, with his speeches, with Safe Islam speeches, put the West in a corner where they had to interfere. In reality, everybody was, at that time, was just getting all the contracts from Gaddafi, so that whether China, Russia, West, the West, they were all in a good terms, getting big contracts. Nobody wanted that revolution. And they gave him all the opportunities to suppress it. It was not out of smartness, it was out of luck. He made all the mistakes that put in, imposed on the international community to have the no-flight zone. I wanted it. Everybody had an agenda. Everybody had reasons for what he do. My reasons were to spare my people's life. Every single day there was people dying. And the one, the biggest battle in Benghazi, it was he used against defenseless people, aircraft missiles and RBG, and we saw the body flying, and the, the city was smelled the smell of flesh. There was lots of heroism in that city and that country. There was lots of stories to be told. I am proud of that because we didn't have stories to tell. We made our history. We made our revolution. It is unique. It humbled every single person who entered to that city at the beginning of the revolution, and they saw things that they have never seen. Everybody cried, everybody lost their neutrality, and they kept advising and talking with us and making our story reach to the outside world. I am happy today. We are over him. He's gone, and I'm happy he's gone for good. I know there's lots of challenges in Libya today. We are in the middle, of, in the crossroad, where we can build a state, a democratic, that respect the rule of law, that respect human rights, or we go to chaos. Weapons are in everybody's hand. I know that we have six borders, and very, very dangerous borders. But at the same time, I'm a very optimistic person. I do believe that we can do whatever we want if we go and fight for it. We have to pay the price. Nothing comes without a price. But at the same time, I'm not a person who will want results now. We have to fight for a long time to build a state the way we want it. We didn't live as we want, but we have to fight for our children and grandchildren. It's not easy. We don't want to repeat the mistakes our the older generation did by being silent, by giving up, by being scared. We broke the wall of fear, and we will not allow it to be built again. There is lots of challenges. Yes, we blame many people, but I blame ourselves first. We never stop fighting for our rights. Today I'm happy because we are players. The people in Libya are players. Yes, they are weak players. They are not strong players, but they are players. Today in Libya, I compare it to a triangle where we have that non-democratic NTC who has to do the role till we elect our new government. We have the people and we have the international community. What I would like from the international community is that they don't push for business as usual. They shouldn't push for business as usual because I know they have interests, they have their private agenda, they have their economic concerns, but business as usual means going back to marginalizations to Libyan cities, to go back to corruptions. That's what we don't want. This is why the revolution started from in the first hand. What we want is to have a real stability in Libya. Libya is a good place to have a stability. We are not like any other country. It's a rich country. It's a six million who are completely Muslims and Maliki and Sunni. Mm -hmm. 
and so we don't have all the dangerous aspects of any other country, uh, whether Tunisia or uh, Egypt. But at the same time, it is a country that's starting from below scratch. We have no institutions. We have nothing. He never, he never spent on anything. We have to start building everything at the same time. We have to work on our judiciary system. We have to work on our military. We have to work on our police. We have to work on our education and health and etc. But at the same time, there is a, a, all these movements that are happening in Libya. We have the civil society is growing stronger. The political parties are being built. The media and the press is gaining momentum there. And the people are enjoying being free, really free. They are enjoying their country. For the first time, we are Libyans. We are not Gaddafi. The first time people are hearing us and not hearing him. The first time people are seeing Libyans, not seeing Gaddafi. It's not easy. It's not rosy, as I said. But the 17th of February 2012, the first memory of our revolution, we proved that we deserve this freedom we fought for and gained because it was so great. Despite all the weapons in everybody's hands, nobody shot any bullets. There was no looting during this whole year, especially in the eastern part. And you have to understand, in the eastern part, we are being liberated since one year, while in the western part, they have been liberated only four or five months ago. So it's a different story in Libya. The Western part has left, the Tripoli especially, left a war, not a revolution. While the rest of the country, they left a revolution more than a, more. So it is a different dynamic in Libya. But there is one thing we all know. We want to build a Libya that we all dream of. A Libya that is respect the rule of law. It's not an easy road. It's not an easy trip. But we will do it. And we will do it safely, hopefully. I'm optimistic. I am optimistic and uh, I know we have, I can echo some of the problems and the concerns my colleagues have, but I'm more optimistic I'm because I'm not waiting for a quick, uh, you know, results. I, I, we cannot see a good judiciary system. I cannot see uh, an ethical leaders. Those people who are controlling all the countries now in the, uh, in the revolutionary countries, they are all age, old age. They have lived under dictatorship, the corruption is an ethic. So it is normal that I cannot blame them. I will fight them, I will pressure them. But I cannot, I don't have a miracle stick to change ethics. Ethics don't change because revolutions happen. Ethics change because we fight to change them. And I do, I'm a human rights activist. Uh, human rights is a conviction for me. I do believe in humanity and the human world and the human dignity, in equality and justice. What we need to do is to fight for that. We need help. In these revolutions, we, I met lots of foreigners from all over the world. Everybody came to Benghazi. And I, we realized how much we have in common. And it's, so it's so beautiful to discuss what we have in common and embrace our di what we have in diverse. It is so beautiful to come and stand together against wars, against dictatorship, to fight for democracy. We will not agree on everything. For sure we don't. We, will have, we are proud of our own cultures. We are, you are proud of yours. But together we can fight for human beings to live in peace. That's happen only through communications, dialogues, and to be to sit on tables and discuss. Uh, for me, uh, I will learn from every experience. I will learn from everybody, but I will take it and mold it according to my cultures, and to my traditions, and to my religion. I'm so proud to be here again. I'm so proud to be a Libyan, and I'm so proud today to inform you that we have a flag and an anthem that we are proud of. Thank you. <laughs>